Good evening, fellow Halibut enjoyers. I'm back. Hey! Hey! Good. Now consume your video gruel like good children. Today, I bring you the holy grail of co-op shooters. I'd like to introduce you to Deep Rock Galactic, a game which, besides being the only one I know of where you can mow down hordes of bugs whilst absolutely pissed drunk, accurately simulates the day of a blue-collar worker under late-stage capitalism. Deep Rock Galactic, developed by indie dev Ghost Ship Games, is a class-based co-op FPS centered around exploring and completing objectives within procedurally generated cave systems. You and up to three lucky chaps play as dwarves, working for the titular company Deep Rock Galactic. Now, Deep Rock is an admirable company, one that embraces the ever-present capitalistic dream of infinite, infinite economic, economic growth. growth. This pursuit has led them to the planet Hoxie's 4, a location containing a variety of flora and fauna, but most importantly, lots of very valuable minerals. However, in a scenario with absolutely zero historical precedent, the natives of Hoxie's 4 are not particularly thrilled with a bunch of funny-looking strangers arriving and destroying their home. These natives unfortunately also happen to be giant bugs called Glyphids, equipped with a variety of different abilities that prove useful in taking hostile action. Your job is to peacefully negotiate with them, a process that usually employs mass quantities of bullets and chemical explosives. If that basic premise entices you, don't mind the enemy. Discovering the many missions, enemies, weapons, and environments Deep Rock has to offer is definitely the most fun going in blind. Now, for those of you who have decided to stay, welcome. Take a seat in the back of my 2003 Honda Civic as we go on a magical adventure filled with alcohol and tiny men with high power firearms. Gameplay in Deep Rock is primarily experienced through its missions. From a hub area called the Space Rig, you'll select randomly generated missions to embark on. These change every half hour, each rotation containing a new set of missions with different objectives, modifiers, and biomes. Selecting a difficulty level and one of four classes to play as, you'll explore randomly generated cave systems made of completely destructible terrain. And when I say completely destructible, I mean it. Nearly everything you tread on can be destroyed by your pickaxe, guns, and grenades. Now, before getting into the real meat and potatoes of a mission, I think I should give you a quick look at what you can expect. While you're making your way through the dark, twisting labyrinths Hoxies is riddled with, you'll be mining minerals, defending points, fixing pipes, and most importantly, shooting bugs. Equipped with a primary and secondary weapon, as well as two support tools, you'll have a primary objective you need to complete for each mission. This objective changes based on mission type. Mining expeditions see you mining a rare, valuable mineral called Morkite. Egg hunts see you collecting alien eggs. And refining missions see you building pipelines and defending a refinery from waves of glyphids. There's enough mission types to keep things routinely fresh, and the randomly generated terrain means that they avoid becoming too repetitive. You also have an optional secondary objective to complete in each mission, which will reward you with bonus gold and XP if completed. To be entirely honest, they're just fetch quests in a hat and trench coat. I mean seriously, why do I have to go and collect these three foot testicles? But they're quick, and they can end up being pretty fun when the escape pod is about to leave, and you nearly die to the giant exploding ghost that's been chasing you for the last half hour, and that you've died to like five times already, and then you don't have any self revives anymore because your teammates all died from your engineer's nukes. Devs, please, I hate the ghost so much! Anyways. On your way to completing these objectives, you'll be attacked by the indigenous population I mentioned earlier. Glyphids will attack you and your crew randomly throughout each mission, with small groups appearing pretty often and large swarms arriving less frequently announced by mission control beforehand. As with any resistance army worth their weight in potatoes, the Glyphids are extremely diverse, each breed equipped with their own special variety of insectoid horror. From basic ankle biters like Glyphid grunts and annoying buggers like Mactera trijaws, to terrifying behemoths like bulk detonators, the different creepy crawlies that make themselves known throughout your time on Hoxies will continually keep you on your toes. Now, you might be saying something along the lines of, Yeah yeah, there's enemies and missions. That still sounds pretty boring after a couple dozen hours. Believe me, I hear you. 
This is where the game really shines, it's caves. In a game starring dwarves, this is an aspect that has to be standout, and as I mentioned before, all the terrain of Deep Rock is randomly generated. This is probably raising a red flag for many of you, as procedural generation is often used to try and cover up bad game design. This usually ends up as effective as painting over a hole you punch in a drywall. However, Deep Rock continually surprises and amazes with the extravagant caverns it can create. Seriously, I have no idea what machine god they had to make a blood sacrifice to, but it was well worth it. These basic caves are augmented with bits and bobs from different biomes in the game. In fact, these biomes often influence the generation of the caves themselves. You'll be dropped into a vast variety of locations, some of my favourites being the frigid tundra of glacial strata, the haunting subterranean forests of Azure Weald, and the volcanic geysers of magma core. Each of these different parts of Hoxies provides their own challenges, be it radioactive variants of glyphids, suspiciously tentacle-like plants, or shreks and nut butter plastered across the cave floor. The atmosphere each sector creates is completely unique and interesting, clearly differentiating them from one another and giving them distinct identities. All of these elements keep the game from wearing thin as you upgrade your gear and get more cosmetics. The last key factor of Deep Rock's core gameplay that makes it so much fun is its four classes, the Scout, Gunner, Engineer, and Driller. Each of these beautiful bastards has their own selection of three primary weapons, three secondary weapons, and a variety of grenades to choose from. Each class is also equipped with two support tools, important equipment that makes exploring Hoxie's depths far easier. First, there's the Scout, arguably the squishiest of all the classes. Generally having longer range primary is good for picking off small groups of Glyphids. For support, the Scout is equipped with a Flare Gun and, more importantly, a Grapple, a grapple Hook. Rapple. The flare gun is extremely useful for lighting up large caves or objective areas, and makes using your bullet based bug spray far easier when Glyphids start crawling out from the walls. The grapple hook is great too, a straightforward shoot and pull A to B. As much of a sucker as I am for swing physics and being able to live out 3 year old me's dream of being Spider Man, it makes way more sense for it to be this way. You'll die enough without having to do a college course's worth of geometry each time you try to cross a gap. As the name might suggest, you'll be forward scouting caves, mining high up minerals, and zipping around trying to find main and secondary objectives. The gunner is the tank of the group equipped with high damage output and high ammo count primaries like a minigun and guided rocket launcher. These are great for mowing down large swarms of bugs en masse. In regards to support tools, the gunner has a bubble shield that can be placed to protect objectives or downed players, and a zipline launcher. The ziplines are extremely handy, as they're pretty much just a permanent grapple hook for all players on your team to use. While the gunner probably seems like the simplest of the classes, there's surprising depth in the role, and having gunner on your crew while delving deep is absolutely vital, especially on higher hazards. Next up is the engineer. Slightly thicker skin than the Scout, the NG is most equipped to deal with small and mid-sized waves from close range. Weapon options include a killer shotgun, a little gooby guy of an SMG, and a shameless ripoff of Titanfall 2's smart pistol. He also has possibly the most useful support tools on the roster, the platform gun and mobile turret. The turret is decent enough when you set it up near a defense point, but the star of the show really is the platform gun. Despite the fact that they look like my cat's vomit, the platforms are very versatile, good for scaling walls in any direction and blocking entrances from glyphids. And lastly, saving scouts with a death wish from throwing themselves off a cliff every time they try to bite a nitro bay. Look, just know that in any lobby without an engineer, they are dearly missed. Last but not least is the Driller, my current favourite class. Highly equipped for crowd control with the choice between a flamethrower, frost thrower, or sludge thrower, the Driller's primaries make you feel like an exterminator walking into an abandoned crack den. Other than standard weaponry, you'll have handheld mining drills and everyone's favourite plastic explosive, C4. Destruction really is the name of the game here, with the drills chewing through dirt like a dog that's just found a chocolate bar. The C4, well, let's just say we partake in a little Tom Foolery. Teamwork is integral to every mission type, not only being relevant to completing objectives, but also to setting up a path through the caves you traverse. The interactions between each class's weapons and gear are interesting, and highlight how carefully put together every aspect of the game is. While you can definitely play solo, in fact, if you do, you'll have a little robot buddy called Bosco to help you out, the real experience is in multiplayer. Which is why I'm also happy to say that DRG has one of, if not the best community I've ever encountered. There's an amazing sense of positivity and camaraderie everywhere, something obviously intended by the devs. The best example of this is the salute key, or as you're more likely to know it, the rock and stone button. At any time, you can have your dwarf raise their pickaxe and spout one of a wide variety of celebratory lines, the most well known of which is ROCK AND STONE! This is a quick and easy way of communicating positivity, and it's now so iconic it's a core part of the game's identity. Survived a wave? ROCK AND STONE! Completed an objective? ROCK AND ROLL AND STONE! New miner arrived. For rock and stone! Just got revived. Rock solid! 
This, combined with other features like a context-sensitive yell button, an easy-to-use ping system, and the entire existence of a space rig, are all elements that Ghost Ship Games has implemented to keep their community healthy and thriving. As you might have seen throughout the video, there is text chat for when more precise communication is needed, but a majority of the time these methods of communication are easier, quicker, and entirely fulfil the needs of the situation. I spent probably two thirds of my 200 plus hours in this game in public lobbies, and I can count my negative experiences on one hand. In between missions, you'll be plopped in the space rig I mentioned earlier, which acts as the game's hub. It's where you'll choose your missions, customise your dwarf, and, most importantly, get smashed with your mates. The Abyss Bar, manned by bartender Lloyd, is where you'll get your grog. Always remember to tip Lloyd, he's a sweetie. I got a Glock in my Rory, 17 shots from the Yeezy's fine, one new one shit. Another important aspect of Deep Rock is its progression. Every piece of gear in every class has its own upgrade tree, allowing you to use different perks depending on how you want your gun to function. Higher damage or higher fire rate. Elemental effects or larger AoE. They're good and spice things up. But the real switch ups come from weapon overclocks. Once you hit level 25 with one of your classes, you'll be able to prestige that class, getting a little star above your player icon. The first time doing this will unlock a variety of new things, one of which is the weapon overclocks I just mentioned. To get weapon overclocks, you'll have to get matrix cores, a crafting material you can only get from a few different time-dependent means. These can be used to craft cosmetics, which I'll come back to later, or weapon overclocks, which come in three different types, clean, balanced, and unstable. Clean and balanced won't change too much about a weapon, generally doing a slightly heavier rebalancing than a standard upgrade would. Unstable overclocks, however, are where the real fun begins. This can completely change a weapon's playstyle, adding elemental effects, massive recoil, and absolutely bonkers ideas like turning the engineer's grenade launcher into a portable nuke launcher. Really, some of the unstable overclocks are proper grouse, but they're really stupid in the best way. It, you just gotta see them to believe it. <laughs> There's another element of progression I haven't touched on yet though, cosmetics. Deep Rock has a veritable mountain of cosmetics to unlock, including hats, beards, hair colors, armor types, weapon frameworks and colors, and even completely customizing your pickaxe part by part. There's a whole community built around customizing dwarves to look silly, cool, or downright disgusting. The player expression available is actually really quite impressive, and it's the process of getting these cosmetics that's the true endgame. You can unlock cosmetics a few different ways, namely the shop, finding them on missions, crafting them with matrix cores, or through Deep Rock's version of a battle pass, the performance pass. Speaking of which, let's touch on monetization. Ghost Ship Games has earned the greatest respect from me, and I think their entire player base, by continually providing free content updates regularly. While it made sense for this to be the case during early access, in early 2020 when the game hit 1.0, they still continued. At first, small content patches came at a regular pace, with cosmetic DLCs releasing alongside them less frequently, but in 2021, they switched to a season-based model. This probably puts a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths, but Ghost Ship has managed to make my favourite implementation of a season pass in any game. Every six months or so, a new season is released, which brings new content with it, like the continuation of the game's loose story. The situations set up by these developments become the foundation for new mission types, new season events, and all the other content included in these updates. There's a season pass included in these patches also, but it's entirely free. There's no paid pass, nor is there any way to pay for tiers. From this pass, you'll unlock hairstyles, paint jobs, and most importantly, script, an alternate currency which is used to progress through the season's cosmetic tree. The cosmetic tree is basically like a skill tree, but instead of upgrades, you unlock cosmetics and crafting materials. It's a great innovation on the standard season pass model, giving you agency in choosing what cosmetics you want to prioritize getting. The best part of Deep Rock's pass, however, is that unlike most other season-based games, the cosmetics are still available after the season ends. They enter the pool of cosmetics available through random chance on missions, meaning that any skin you miss out on can still be encountered at some time in the future. Lastly, I'd like to quickly touch on modding. If you hadn't gathered from my red match video, which, if you haven't seen, do not bother watching, I'm a big proponent of developers supporting the modding scene of their games. Deep Rock, in a quite surprising move for an online game of its type, has full modding support in-game through mod.io. Mods are categorised based on how much they change gameplay and progression. To be entirely honest, I've barely dipped my toes into the modding scene, only trying out a few kind of sound change stuff. But even from the little I've seen, it's quite clear how valuable it is, because people get tired of vanilla. It's just a great way to keep the game alive. I haven't even touched on deep dives or mission modifiers, let alone the game's music and art direction. But Deep Rock really is one of the best co-op games out there right now, and a surefire way to have a blast with your mates. The devs deserve all the support they can get, and I promise you it'll be one of your new go-tos if you pick it up. Anyways, if you enjoyed, drop a like or something, as writing the script for this uh, took about 10 years off the end of my life. And uh, despite what I said earlier, you you can go check out the Red Match video. The audio quality and writing are not great. I had COVID at the time, but it's not entirely awful. Uh, yeah, that's all. 
Thanks. 18 hairy dwarves in the space rig at Deep Rock.